Welcome everybody, glad to see you here. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing out.
on my door on bended knee In Christ the Lord, the newborn King your love for us. We thank you for giving us life. And God, we worship you this morning and we thank you for the cross and giving it all for us. We praise you, our God and our King. And there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. Streams of grace flow deep and wide Where all the love I've ever found Comes like a flood, comes flowing down Let's sing it out together
together in here my hope is found here on holy ground here i bow down here i bow down here arms open wide here you save my life here i bow down here i bow down. God, we bow before you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the salvation that we have through your son, Jesus. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And this morning, we stand in awe of you. We stand in awe of our creator. We stand in, in awe of you, God, Emmanuel. God with us, especially during this season of Christmas, God, we thank you for showing us the way. We thank you for leading us into your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We can go ahead and have a seat. And as we prepare for communion today, we're going to have uh, the guys come forward in just a minute. They're going to pass out this piece of bread and this cup of juice. And while we continue to sing, while we continue to worship, I encourage you to take that bread, take that cup, and just take a moment uh, of reflection to look inward, to look into yourself, not to worry about your neighbor, not to worry about what's going on later today, but just to take that moment and say, thank you, God, for the cross. Thank you, God, for giving it all for me, especially during this Christmas season as we celebrate that Christ was born. You see, he was born for a purpose, to show us the way to true freedom in him, and he did that through the cross. So this morning, uh, let's just give it all to him because he gave it all to us. So let's pray one more time before we take communion. God, we thank you again for your rich mercy, for your rich grace. And this morning, God, we look to you, the author and creator of our faith. And, and we simply come before you just to say thank you for giving it all. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Morning, church. It's great to see everybody. Was the snow okay this morning? <laughs> hey, let's stand up. Greet. It's, uh, we're so far and few between. Stand up, greet somebody, at least two people, and say, fear not. Fear not. It's gl I'm glad to be back. I was away last week marrying my niece in Kentucky because that's just what you do. Right. And uh, Pastor Phil, I heard let everybody know that I was doing that. So it's good to be back and uh, to be able to celebrate with you. Um, just a couple of announcements. The last Sunday of the month, we are going to uh, do a baptism Sunday. For those of you, that's your next step. You have an opportunity to do that. I think we have information in the bulletin about that. And also this is every year we do random acts of kindness. And uh, this is the month for it. We saw the video. There's cards. There, there might have been some on your seat. And just go out and bless somebody somehow, some way, and uh, just give them a card. I mean, there are people waiting to be invited to church. They're just waiting to be invited to church. This is an incredible opportunity to invite them to one of our services, especially our, our Christmas Eve service. Uh, just spoke with a, a gentleman in the first hour. He left the first time he'd been to church. Uh, in years, I don't know if he'd ever been to church, actually. He was just going out, just heartbroken that God could love him so much. People are just waiting. So take an opportunity uh, to invite somebody um, and do that. Um, we are beginning a brand new uh, message series, a three-part message series today entitled When Angels Speak. And we're looking at three different occasions in the Christmas story when an angel appears and visits and gives a message to three uh, different groups of people. Today, we're looking at when the angel visits Mary and he gives her a message and encourages her to take a step of faith because the angel has a new purpose for her life. And uh, we say a lot around here, God created us on purpose with a purpose and for a purpose, right? But the thing we're going to learn about Mary <clears throat> is she had to fear not because she feared. And a lot of us fear God's plans for our life at times. And like Mary, I think we're really going to be able to relate to that. And I think there are a lot of people that sometimes treat God like that annoying person in your life that's always wanting something. You know who I'm talking about? Like when they call you on the phone, you know they're going to ask you for something. So what do you do? You let it go to voicemail, right? Or you're in the grocery store and you're out in public and you see that person out there because everybody's got one, right? And you see them and you take your cart and you go, I hope they didn't see me, right? And you go the other way. And sometimes I think unknowingly, we treat God like that, like that annoying person, because why? We want to be close enough to God to get the good stuff, right? His blessings, the promise of heaven, um, just the blessings that he has for us. But we don't want to be so surrendered in every area of our life because why? Because when we do, what will God might do? He might call me to be a missionary to Africa, right? Or he might want me to clean up some area of my life that I like doing, right? Or he might sometimes want to make me marry an ugly person. Now, I knew a guy that actually didn't want to surrender to God's will because they were afraid of that, right? And sometimes there's this sense of genuine fear. What if I surrender fully to God and my life doesn't turn out the way that I wanted it to turn out, right? And fear can keep us from taking that step of faith that God wants us to take. I've heard it said before that that fear, that, that faith is the absence of fear. Faith, fear is the absence of faith. Fear is the absence of faith. Well, I would agree and argue that, that fear is actually faith, but faith in the wrong things. Faith in the like, kind of like the what ifs of life, right? What if I lose my job? What if the economy falls apart? What if somebody I love has cancer? What if I never marry? What if I marry a jerk? What if I marry a jerk and have kids and they look like the jerk and I'm forever, forever reminded I married a jerk? You know, things can happen like that. Fear is placing our faith in the wrong uh, worst case scenario. I can be very easily overtaken by irrational fear at times. Now, I don't know if uh, this is like, like if you are married, like I love my wife, but we're very opposites in so many areas, right? Like one of the things that we're opposites in is I'm always late 
So if I tell my wife, I want to be home at 7 o'clock, she knows to expect me by 7.30. And my wife is, is the other way. She's, she's always on time or always early. Like she says, hey, I want to be home at 7 o'clock. She might be home 10 minutes before 7. So here's how my irrational fears can play out. And she says, you're going to be home at 7 o'clock, right? And my watch, it's, it's 7.05. It's 7.07. It's and all of a sudden, I'm thinking, oh, she's been T-boned. She's had a wreck. She's died in a car crash. I mean, that, I, mean I, I, I can project, like, for the rest of my life in that instant. Like, you know, she, she, she's, she's being killed. And I'm like, I'm going to have to quit the ministry because there's no way that I can do this without her. And we homeschool our three young kids. And, and, and it's like, now dad's going to have to homeschool them. And so I'm going to have kids that are ignorant growing up, right? <laughs> you know, so I'm going to have to do this. And I think, how is, is anybody going to want to marry an old guy with three young kids? And so I project all the way to the end of my, I'm going to be 68 years old, a bachelor with the three dumb kids. <laughs> Why? Because my wife was 10 minutes late. And I can be project just in an instant because we have all these irrational fears that pop up. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Look at this verse, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a what? A spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So I want to begin today by asking this question. Why are we sometimes fearful of God's plan for our life, our, his purpose for our life? Why do we sometimes uh, have fear when that comes up? And I think we could all each answer that differently, but I want to focus on two answers that come from this story when the angel gave a message to young Mary. And the first one, if you're taking notes, is this. God's interruptions are often inconvenient. God's interruptions in our life are sometimes perceived by us as, as inconvenient. So let's begin with Mary when the angel spoke to her in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, when we read, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. He was named, named Mary. You know, I mean, think about how we think about angels today. I think some people have a misperception about angels, that we think that angels are these bald, little, fat, baby-faced angels with wings playing a harp, right? But, but that's no, not the way really angels are. They are warrior-like creatures, able to, at the command of God, destroy a nation, able to submit to God in, in such a powerful way as to take care of an innocent baby. And here we see, we see two name, angels named in Scripture. This one's Gabriel, and, and the other is uh, uh, Michael, the archangel. So the angel is coming to her speaking, and, and, and the Bible goes on to say, Mary was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And then it goes on. Gabriel appeared to her, and said, greetings favored woman. It was a very polite angel. Greetings favored woman. The Lord is with you. And look at this next phrase, confused and disturbed, confused and disturbed. Mary was probably like, well, I'd love to see an angel someday, but now she sees an angel and she's terrified, right? She's freaking out, confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. What could this mean, being visited by an angel? So think about this. I mean, Mary, what's going through her mind? She's like 14, 15, or 16 years old. We're not told in Scripture, but in this day, uh, when, in, in day and age, in, in this period, when a girl would reach puberty or thereafter, she would be betrothed or engaged to be married. So here she is, this young girl, thinking about, I mean, in her mind, she's thinking about, she's planning out her life, right? What's life going to be like? And if we translate that to modern day, what would a young girl like this be thinking? Kind of like what my niece did in preparation for her special day last week. She probably would go on Pinterest and find all the creative ideas to have the most wonderful, beautiful day. And what else would she be doing? She'd be practicing her new name and writing her signature out, how she was going to sign everything, and she'd be preparing for that. And suddenly, this angel comes and totally interrupts her plans. So, what can this all mean? She had to ponder. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this segment of this story? We can learn this, that instead of seeing interruptions as inconvenient, 
we might see an interruption of God as an invitation to something greater and bigger and better and different in our life. I mean, think about how God interrupted so many people throughout Scripture. I mean, I think about Moses. How did God interrupt him? One day he's going along and God interrupts him with a burning bush. But really that interruption ended up being an invitation for Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. I think of Jonah. God interrupted him when he was thrown overboard off a ship in a storm. God interrupted his swim to shore by being swallowed by a big fish. But that was really an invitation to say, Jonah, you need to do what I told you to do and go back to Nineveh and preach a message of repentance. Then I think of in the New Testament, Saul killing Christians. God interrupted him with a bright light on the road to Damascus. But it was really an invitation for the apostle Paul's life to be transformed, to preach the good news and the right, like most of our New Testament. God interrupted their plans, but it was an invitation to something bigger and better. And I, and I think there are times when we as people shake off God's interruptions and we don't really see them as an invitation in our life. But God wants, he wants to interrupt our lives because he is always inviting us to take that step of faith, to do something of his plan and of his purpose. And I don't know how this will play out for you, but it might be something just as simple as you have a friend in the hospital and, and you like, you have this urge and like, you know, I really should go see my friend. And you're like, well, why? I don't have time for that. And you decide to act on that interruption and you go and you're talking to your friend lying there who's ill and you have this conversation and words are coming to you and you're like, where's this coming from? And when you leave that hospital room, you're amazed that God just used me to minister to my friend and, and you leave and you realize that was an invitation for God to, to just work through you and how we can be on that spiritual high because we know God actually used us. Or we come to church, right? And, and it's announced, hey, there's a need. And you're like, I could do that, but I really don't want to do that on a Sunday. But when you go out, you find yourself at the sign-up sheet and you're like, what am I doing? And you're signing up for this thing. I mean, and you've just signed up for serving in the preschool area and you hate preschoolers. <laughs> what am I doing? But a couple of months later, your thinking is going, you know what? That hour on Sunday is the most wonderful time and highlight of my week because I'm able to impart spiritual truths to preschoolers. And you realize that that was an invitation of God inviting you to something bigger and better in your life where you're being able to be used by God. What happened? God interrupted you and invited you to something different. And this angel appears to Mary, this girl who has her future planned out and says, look, I'm inviting you to something different. And we go on to, and it frightens her, and we go on to read this in verse 30. The angel said, fear not in the King James, or do, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. Now, that sounds great. I mean, if God's handing out favor, I want a little favor. Right? Well, give me some of that, God. And, and Mary's thinking, oh, favor. I found favor with God. And she's like, oh, I bet this has to do with my wedding. I mean, I'm, maybe, maybe I'm going to be on a reality, a wedding reality show, and my wedding's going to be paid for. Woo! And my reception, that's going to be paid for. Awesome. I mean, say yes to the dress. This is Jerusalem style. You think that's cool. And Mary's thinking, I'm gonna, I found favor. But she didn't realize the plan that God had for her, right? So number one, why are we often afraid of God's purposes and plan? Uh, we're afraid because his interruptions or the interruptions in our life are often seen as inconvenient. And number two, if you're taking notes, God's purpose is often different than your plans. When we think about our future and we think about God interrupting and inviting us, oftentimes his purpose is way different than what we have planned. And we see this next. When the angel actually reveals God's purpose to this young girl, verse 31, he says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. And Mary's going, what? Wait, that's favor? <laughs> and then the next verse, the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And she's going, what? 
this is favor? Can you imagine the emotion, the emotional swing that, that Mary's got to be going through in this moment when God interrupts her, invites her? I mean, instantly, she had to be humbled by this. I get to give birth to, to the Son of God and raise him. So all of it, but, but then she's thinking, so there's this humility. Oh, but then she's got to be thinking, fear. I'm going to be pregnant out of wedlock. And in that day, if you were pregnant and not married, you could be stoned to death, the death penalty. So on one hand, she's thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to give birth to the Savior of the world. And on the other hand, she's thinking, I've got to tell Joseph. Can you imagine that conversation? Hey, Joey, you sitting down? Yeah, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You ever heard of him? I mean, can you imagine how this conversation, how crazy it would be? But God's purpose was so, 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 so different than what she had planned, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, just as God's purposes are higher than our purposes. His ways are higher than ways. His plans are so different and higher than our plans. And when God interrupts, we've got to see it as an invitation that can be so different than what we could have ever dreamed or imagined. And I don't know how it could happen in your life, but I mean, just think about maybe you plan to have an incredible marriage and a wonderful family to have kids, and all of a sudden you find out that you're going to uh, give birth to a child with special needs, and you're just freaking out. I mean, how, how can this be us? But then you don't understand that you're going to go on to have that child, and that child is going to be such a blessing to you, and, and you're gonna, it's going to draw you closer to God, and, and the love that wells up for that child is going to be something like you never imagined because God's purpose is often different than our plans, right? You might lose a job and be freaking out. How can I pay the bills? This is horrible. And as things work out, you have no other options, but you've had this idea for a business in the back of your mind. You go on to do that business, and years later, you look back and you think what you thought was a curse by losing your job was really a blessing because God's plan, his purpose was different than, than your plan. Or I thought I was going to marry this person. They were perfect. Things went south, and you're like, I'll never be able to find anybody again like that. But God is preparing for you that special person for you to marry that you're going to serve God with that you couldn't even imagine because his purpose is different than, than your plan. God's purposes can be so different than what we plan. Um, I want to tell you this crazy illustration that happened a few weeks ago to me. I was, uh, when I, let me tell you first, when, when, I, when I study, when I work, I can't think unless I put my feet up on something, sometimes the desk, whatever it is, uh, even in meetings sometimes, I mean, I just, I got to put my feet up. I'm like, you mind if I put my feet up? Because I just do better with my feet up. I don't know what that is. But, <laughs> and so I'll tell you that. Just, uh, several weeks ago, my wife and I got to go to uh, a preacher's and preacher's wife's conference. And uh, it was uh, going to start on a Monday, so we flew out on Sunday. So it was a really long day. We flew out a day early to go visit my best friend in Phoenix. So we had church, and we had the drive up to the airport, the flight. 30-minute drive to my best friend's house, got there. It's kind of late, but we wanted to maximize our time and catch up. So Mark invited me to sit on his wonderful recliner couch. And I got to put my feet up, right? And so we got to talk and catch up. And, and he told me about he and his wife, Kelly, how they bought this massage chair. And he said, why don't you come? Let's, let's get up and you can go check out my massage chair. And, and I'm thinking, massage chair? It's like, you know, I'm, why would I want to get on something that wiggles and jiggles and something like that? That's what's going through my head, right? But I didn't tell Mark that. And I said, no, I'm, 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 I love this recliner couch you got here. So uh, the next day, we finally got caught up, went to bed, got up the next day. And we were talking, and he says, you, really, you, you've got to check out, you got to check out this massage chair we've got. So to humor him, I'm like, okay, let's do it. And uh, I said, okay, we got a few minutes, just give me 10 minutes on it. He said, okay, we walked into where the chair was. I walk in and see this, this chair that looked like it should be in a space shuttle as one of the chairs there, you know, and it's like, eh. He, he asked me to take my shoes off, so I took my shoes off. I sit in this chair, and uh, Mark gets the remote, he sets it. He says, I'll be back in 10 minutes. He walked out of the room, and that's when it happened. This massage chair 
it like took off. It like did one of these things and it kicked my feet up all of a sudden. And all of a sudden this stereo sound of music came on. It was like I was in the forest. These birds were singing. I was just transported to somewhere else in the world. And it raised me up and it stretched my back out and my legs out. And all of a sudden it was like hundreds of little hands just started massaging my body in different zones. It was like my hand. It just took my hand and started working its way up my shoulder and this hand and it worked it. All of a sudden this heat started coming on my back and it stretched me out again and all these little fingertips went down the spine of my back and I don't know how it did it but my feet were stretched out it was like it measured my ankles and a little hand came up and started massaging my Achilles tendon I'm like are you kidding me when the 10 minutes was up I'm going give me more give me more so I was freaking out and I'm like I could have done this last night for like 30 minutes but I settled for a recliner couch are you kidding me and you know what? There's somebody. To, I don't know if you're going to get this, but I had fun with that illustration. Some of you right now are settling for a recliner couch when you could have a massage chair that's heated with stereo. I'm telling you, there's some young lady going to walk out of here today and go talk to her boyfriend and say, you're a recliner couch, and I'm going to go get me a massage chair with stereo that's heated. Sometimes we miss the purpose of God, don't we? because we don't trust that he has something better for us. And we've got to trust him that he really does have something better. Check out this verse in verse 34. <laughs> Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. She's like, I'm supposed to give birth to a child. I'm a virgin. This can't happen. There's no way. This is impossible. No way. It would, it would be like, for me, I don't play golf very much. Last time I played golf was last summer with Pastor Phil, and I only did it then because I love Pastor Phil, and the round was free. But it would be like if, the angel, if an angel would come to me and say, Greg, you're going to win the U.S. Open. Yeah, right, God. I mean, it would be, it'd be like whenever you can quote Princess Bride, it pleases God in a message, I would be like, that's inconceivable, you know, because I could never win the U.S. Open. And this is Mary right here. I'm a virgin, and virgins don't give birth to babies. This is impossible. There's going to come a time when God is going to invite you to something, and you're going to think there's no way, no how. It's totally impossible. And I don't know what that will look like, but God might say, I want you to forgive that person. And you're going to go, no way can I forgive that person after what they did to me. Or, they, or God's going to prompt you, uh, to, uh, you want me to be generous right now when we can barely make ends meet? I, I don't even, that's, that's, that's possible. God, there's no way you could heal my marriage. What are you talking about? You want to bring harmony. There's no way after what's been done. You, you want me to bring reconciliation to my kids after what they said to me? God, there's no way. That is totally impossible. Mary's like, this is impossible. There's no way. But look at verse 35. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. In other, in other words, this isn't a job for people. This is a God-sized job, right? The Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Now, this is one of the most amazing verses, this next one, in the whole of Scripture. And it says this. The angel says, for how much is impossible with God? Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing is impossible with God. And I don't know who came to church today, but you need to hear this message because you're facing an obstacle and God is saying nothing is impossible with God. Oh yeah, with man, a lot of things are possible, but nothing is impossible with God. We serve a God who is all knowing. He is all loving. And just with one spoken word, he can change things in an instant. Our God is that good and all things are possible with God. So I want to ask you, one very simple question. What is God asking you to do or believe? What is God asking you to do or believe? What step of faith is he asking you to do right now? For some of you, you know what it is because you've been resisting him. For others, you might need to 
Think about it for a few moments. Pray about it for a few days. God, what is it that you want me to do? And, he, and trust him that he's going to give you an answer. Some of you are, are going to know it, and it's like, that, that's it. I'm supposed to be involved in this or that ministry. For some of you, it, it's going to be to restore a relationship as you listen for God's direction in that. Some of you, it might be that you're going you're to reach out to somebody who you know is far from God, and you're like, I've tried that before, but you know, what? Okay, okay, I'll do it again. What is God asking you to do or to believe? And when you get ready to respond and, and just take that step of faith, this is what I want you to remember, to be thinking about. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is yours. Outcome is God's responsibility. God, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I don't know what step to take. I don't want, no, no, you don't think about that. You, you do it because the outcome, obedience is ours. We are to follow that lead, how God speaks to us, and understand that outcome is his responsibility. We just need to take that step of faith and to be obedient. And I, and I can tell you recently uh, just how that's happened uh, in this church. Uh, we've known for quite some time that we were going to need to go to three services um, uh, because of our capacity. Statistics say when we reach 80%, uh, uh, which we're nearing, that, that we need to do that. So we've been praying, God, give us wisdom in that. We don't want to go too early. We don't want to go too late on that. And, and so we've been preparing for that and praying for that. But the difficulty that we've been having is in our children's area because we only have children's programming in the second hour right now. And so the children have been back here. But the, the difficulty there is we're overflowing in the second hour. And, and we needed to bring uh, the children's, children's programming to the first hour, but we didn't have the people to do that. So we're praying, God, what do we do? What do we do? Well, two teachers, two volunteers who volunteer in our kid zone the second hour were like, we got to do whatever it takes. We just got to start having preschool nursery in the first hour, and, and, and we just got to do it. Whether we got to be in there the entire time or what, we got to do it. So it was planned, and on the first Sunday in December, we started having the, the preschool and nursery in the first hour. And we made the schedule out because somebody said, we've got to take a step of faith. And I'm telling you what, we got the schedule filled out with volunteers for that first hour, and we're so thankful for that because we just had to take that step and allow God to follow through with that outcome. And we're planning for the next quarter, and there have been other people to step up and volunteers to say, we're going to do this, we're going to make this happen. So what happened? We just took that step of faith and decided, God, ours is to be obedient. The outcome is going to be your responsibility. And I don't know how this might play out in your life, but there is going to come a time when God calls on you that you simply have to take a step of faith and then you simply got to trust him. It's like God might be calling you when we start small groups in February. You got to have a small group and you're going, God, no, I, I can't do that. What, what, do you, what do you mean? I mean, our house? No. And, and we just have to step out in faith and trust God that he's going to follow through. Well, God's calling me to tithe. He's calling me to, to give a, a year-end gift. God, I, I can't even take care of all my bills. What do you ask me to do? We're to trust him that he's going to bring the follow-through. But, Lord, I, we, we've already had three kids. We thought we were finished, and now you're calling us to foster children? Well, we don't even have enough, a big enough car. No, 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 no. We're to trust him and allow him that he's going to follow through. Obedience is ours outcome is God's part. And so we surrender to him and we take that step of faith, just like this young girl did, this teenage girl 2000 years ago, when God interrupted Mary and her future plans to step toward a higher calling. When she learned with all, all things are possible with God, she learned that. And the angel put this opportunity in front of her just like God is going to put in front of us. And we need to be faithful to her. And we really, my hope and prayer for you is that you would respond like Mary. Look at this next verse, verse 38. Mary responded to all of this stuff by saying, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant. Can you say that with me? I am the Lord's servant. In other words, before anything else, she needed to realize that who she is and whose she is. And she said, I am 
the daughter of the Most High King, and he is calling me to something different. Is it going to be difficult? Yeah, this might cost me something, but I'm going to take that step of faith because I know this is God's purpose and plan for my life. And it's far different than what I was planning. And then the next verse, here's the step of faith. This is what Mary said. May everything you have said about me come true. May everything you've said to me, Angel, that it would come true, that I'm not going to have any fear whatsoever because your plans are higher than my plans. Your ways are higher than my ways. I'm going to be obedient in taking that next step, and I'm going to trust God that you are going to work everything out. And we say to God, may it be to me just as you said. And we're going to trust, and we're going to take that step of faith. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this season when we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, where you just around the world and in our hearts, every year at this time, <clears throat> there's just something special that you do to open them up where we can yield and surrender to you. And I pray that we would hear your message, that, that you speak to us through your word, through godly people, through prayer, that we could hear your voice, your still small voice, and understand what it is that you're urging to do, that we would not miss that interruption, but that we would see it as an invitation from you, the Most High God. Father, I pray for that in our life. I pray that we would not fear that you are calling us to something different sometimes, something bigger sometimes, something better sometimes. And when we trust and obey, that we would see how you make good. Father, I pray that we would pray, and I would pray that we would obey. And Father, I, I pray today for those who've never even received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that he just wasn't born a baby, but you were very purposeful with his life, that he grew up and died a sinner's death on a cross to forgive us of our sins. Oh, Lord, are we sinners? I pray that we would recognize that. For that one person who's never taken that step of faith, that that would be their next step and see you clearly, that you have a better plan for their life than that they have for their own, that they would willingly surrender, knowing that, that you're not going to take him down a path that would be totally boring, but you would give them life that's truly life. I pray to that end for each, each of us that we would not leave here today without opening up our lives and surrender to you. We ask this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody agreed, said amen. And amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing and celebrate Jesus. And we're going to receive an offering at this time. If you have a Connect card, drop that in there. If you have, would love to have somebody pray with you. There will be people over here by the tree. Oh, you.